Hello, you're listening to NPR. No, you're not. Wow. Can we get sued for that? Uh, no, you're listening to The Mentors. Oh, wow. This is a different intro than what you're used to. Why? Well, we decided to do something different today. Today, we're rebroadcasting an old episode. Actually, it's episode 7, Becoming Unstuck, How to Finally Get Started. We decided to try this because... We have now 131 episodes in our arsenal, and there's some gold from way back when, when we started this podcast in the beginning of 2018, that some of our new audience may not have had a chance to listen to. Probably not everybody goes back 130 episodes and listens to every single one, and so we wanted to make it very easy and convenient for you to listen to this episode that was relatively popular even back then, considering we had just started the podcast a couple weeks before that. Yeah, we ended up writing an article on Goldcast for this as well that did really well. And so we figured it's a topic that's still relevant to a lot of people. Even we ourselves sometimes feel stuck in our lives. It could happen at any time. So if you haven't heard this episode, give it a listen. We share some personal stories like how I got into acting, how Vadim got into teaching. At periods in our lives where we didn't have much direction, and that's what the episode is all about, is how do you move forward? How do you move from a standstill even when your direction is not very clear? Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome back to The The Mentors. Mentors. Well, we were Mm. off pitch. Let's redo that. No, we won't. Mm, We won't. Hello, Uh, guys and gals and men and women and children and uh, dinosaurs. Infants that are well ahead of their intellect and can actually understand what we're talking about. This is Sergey and Vadim Rebzin. Targeting the infant demographic. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) They're largely ignored by the podcast community. How's everyone doing? We are The Mentors, um, and this is a show where we provide insights into how entrepreneurs get businesses off the ground. Actually, to clarify, all creators get their initiatives off the ground uh, and overcome the clearly inevitable obstacles along the way. That's right, Vadim. And the topic that we're going to talk about today is actually something that's fairly top of mind for Vadim and I. Um, We are going to talk about how to get unstuck and actually make progress toward the things that you want to do. What do we mean by how to get unstuck? Uh, It's this feeling that tends to creep up, I think, on all of us. It certainly has crept up on us throughout our lives and careers and our friends and even our enemies, most certainly. We don't have any enemies, obviously. Everybody loves us. Uh, But, uh, you know, it's that feeling of restlessness. Uh, Typically, I mean, it can come from a lot of different sources. A lot of times for me personally, and I know Sergey as well, it has come um, at some point in my career where I just realized that I'm not using my skills, my strengths, my interests to their full potential. Right. It's, it's, It's the feeling that you should be doing more or you're meant to do more than you actually are doing and feeling stuck like you can't actually get there. Um, So we'll dive a little bit more into what that means in a second. But the reason why this topic is so top of mind for us today, but also most days, is I think the the community that that we deal with, uh, with Vadim's work as uh, EIR at Gen FKD, where he's a lecturer at a university and is dealing with college students that are getting ready to graduate and are uncertain about what path they should follow because they feel like whatever they choose is going to determine the rest of their lives. That's uh, that's a mistake to think that because you can always change your situation. And of course, with my work uh, through Venture for America as entrepreneur in residence and, and director of the founder programs there, where I work with uh, recent graduates who are trying to make sure they're uh, leveling up in their careers and getting to a point where they can actually start their own businesses, oftentimes not being certain how to get to that point. But this can happen at any time. It could be in your teens, your 20s, your 30s, your 50s. As a matter of fact, uh, we had a really cool conversation this week uh, with a gentleman that's going to be on our podcast next week who started his business at 50 years old and ended up succeeding. Of course, you'll hear more about that next week. But that feeling of being stuck uh, can come at any point. And again, typically it happens when you're not using your skills to full potential. So the reason why we're talking to you about it today is not because we have mastered this skill and we never feel stuck, uh, but because 
there's been certain periods of our life where we did feel this and it's always been the same exact process that helped us get out of that funk, helped us get out of that feeling of, let's face it, helplessness sometimes, which sucks. Notice that Vadim said period of our life because we essentially share one life. That's that's just a side effect of being a twin. We shared a uterus uh, in the womb and Thanks, we continue Mom. to share a life. Thanks, Mama. And a brain, apparently? No. Well, um, so uh, we're going to talk uh, through a couple of anecdotes as to how we were able to get unstuck and make progress toward passions, dreams of ours. Uh, I'm going to talk about how I got to a pretty interesting point in my acting career, which I don't know if I would call it a career, but I've done some cool stuff. And, and I'm going to talk about how I got into teaching even though at a university level, even though I had never taught a university class or a high school class or anything like that yeah. before. And really getting paid for teaching, which is not easy to do. Even for teachers, uh, getting paid for teaching is a, is a struggle. So hopefully that will change, but that's a whole other yeah. podcast episode. Yeah. Um, so... We have a bit of a framework that we've developed throughout the years for how we deal with these situations, or at least how we approach them. And it's not really like a framework that you have to have written down that you look at just when you feel these things. It's something that I think once you've internalized, uh, it sort of becomes a habit in your life or habits in your lives. Uh, so, Vadim, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, sort of the first step of getting unstuck, if you will? Sure. The first step is um, essentially resetting uh, your thinking and resetting your mind, if you will. And really, that's the same as saying becoming aware. Uh, becoming aware of why you're feeling the way you're feeling and ultimately questioning why you're feeling the way you're feeling. So the problem is a lot of people are conditioned to sort of do things or continue doing things that the way they've always been doing them. They think that life needs to be led in a certain way. And really, we're, we're, we're taught to do this since from a very early age, right? Um, you know, you, you go to school, you go to college, you get a job that's financially secure, uh, you kind of capitalize on whatever makes the most money for you, then you get a bunch of responsibilities and and that's how you ultimately get to a point of feeling stuck. So the first step towards becoming unstuck is understanding why you're feeling the way you're feeling and uh, trying to get out of it. So asking yourself, why? Why am I feeling like this? And understanding that this is a lot of times a symptom of how you were raised and really uh, of the people around you as well, right? The fact that there's certain expectations that you have of yourself and you think other people have of you as well. Um, and that ultimately leads to inaction. But if you aren't even aware of why you're feeling these feelings, you'll never get to the next stage. What feelings are you referring to, Vadim? Uh, you know, depression, uh, guilt. No, um, <laughs> well, depression actually can come from this. But really the feeling of uh, guilt, right? Uh, oh, I can't do what it is I always wanted to do. Or I can't act towards, um, you know, uh, fulfilling my goals because I have all these different responsibilities and also my mom, my dad are going to uh, be upset with me if I start doing something different, right? Or start doing something or acting towards what I think I was meant to do. Right. And, you know, to be to be fair, uh, there is a reason for uh, the way that society is sort of created and the map, if you will, that you're given by your parents, by your teachers, etc., uh, as to what sort of milestones you sh you should reach in your life and what you should strive for, it it acts as a good guideline and framework for you to to be able to fall back on something. And I think generally most people do need a, a map and directions in order to um, to have a, a a lifestyle where they can you know have a nice house or at least have a place to live, have a family, be able to afford uh, food, be able to afford vacations, etc. But some of us want more from life. Uh, want, you know, perhaps perhaps certain things that other people feel like they can't do or only a small percentage of the population can afford to do. Some of us wake up thinking, why can't I be the one to do this? Uh, so acting could be something that falls under that category. Dancing, uh, music, starting a business, starting a small business, opening a restaurant, uh, really, you name it, but any endeavor that feels risky that doesn't guarantee income, so any endeavor that's outside of a nine to five job may be considered by society as something that you have to be ultra talented to pursue. But from our experience, at least, 
so many of the people that are very successful are not really that much more talented than the next person at that thing. They became better at it over time. Um, they had confidence in themselves to tap into some other talents to to be able to succeed in that realm, but they weren't innately the most talented person in the room, or they weren't born that way. You have to remember, if you start progressing towards something, if you start working towards strengthening a particular skill, or even learning something about a particular subject, within a very short period of time, you, by all intents and purposes, are considered an expert. In other words, if you spend any concerted effort on it, and by the way, blockchain is a great example. There's not a lot of experts right now in blockchain technology, but if you spend any effort on actually digging deep into it and understanding the field, you already know more than 99% of the population about that particular field. So it really just takes an effort and deliberately working towards that um, to already become an expert, so to speak. And the other thing with resetting your mind is... Why, why should I even worry about um, becoming aware of why I'm feeling in a certain way? Why, why even do this work? You know what? I'm totally fine. I'm, I'm working nine to five. I come home. I spend time with my kids. First of all, if you're happy with that, by all means. You've achieved happiness and fulfillment. You really don't need to uh, do anything else. Read The Alchemist. It's a perfect uh, book uh, that shines uh, around this example. But if you do feel like you need to do something else, you only live once. YOLO. 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 Um, and you owe it to yourself to find out what it is that will make you happy in your life. Uh, because if you don't, there's a very good chance you're going to live through life uh, as a miserable person or at the very least as a numb person. And as they always say, you know, when you turn around and look back at your life on your deathbed at 75 years old, you're going to wish that you did something else. So you owe to yourself to find that happiness. And that means first becoming aware and understanding why it is you're not acting towards um, uh, becoming a better you and, and becoming happier and doing something that really, really uh, makes you feel fulfilled. So speaking of acting, uh, I'll tell you a little bit of an anecdote from my own life. Um, I remember Vadim and I grew up watching I Love Lucy uh, because that's how we learned English. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Lucille Ball. Love her. And uh, for some reason, I, I saw a documentary on her career and I got in my head that I really want to be an actor. Now, I'm not one to be that interested in becoming a starving artist and dropping everything I'm doing uh, to be an actor full-time, which is why I'm not an actor full-time. But um, around my early 20s, I had this idea that I want to give it a shot. Uh, I, at one point, I was in between jobs and I wanted to try acting a little bit more seriously. My goal was to see if I can get a, even a small role on uh, like a real production. And... You know, we're talking about resetting our thinking here. I actually took an acting class where we got to pitch or we got to, I should say, um, do a scene in front of an agent. And at the end of the scene, the agent told me, like, why are you doing this? You are not good at this. <laughs> he said, first of all, he said, why did you choose that scene? It's such a difficult scene to do. You should have just at least chosen something you're good at. Now, I thought it was all right, but hey, to each their own. So I could have walked away from that experience thinking, well, I should just give up, right? This one person, this agent who sees many actors told, told me I don't have it. Uh, and how am I ever going to get break into acting without an agent? But I chose to sort of reframe my thinking and said, okay, if I don't have enough experience to be attractive to somebody that is experienced, how can I create that for myself? All I had done was a couple of plays in, in school and a musical in college. Enough for, to have a little bit of a resume, but nothing really impressive for anybody else. So I decided right then and there that I'm going to try to find a production, uh, a feature-length film, which is a full-length film, that is being created where they're looking for free actors, and I'm just going to use my tiny little resume of two things to try to get a gig on, on a feature film, but I'm not going to agree to do anything unless it's a significant speaking role, one of the leads. And it took me about... I think four or five months of searching Craigslist for roles, but I ended up finding this film being uh, created by these two young film students uh, with a tiny budget, I think about ten, fifteen thousand dollars total, which for a movie, uh, most movies are in the in the millions, if not tens of millions. Uh, but um, but they needed a, an actor, and they weren't able to pay them, so my little resume was enough. And I ended up getting a role that was fairly significant. It turned out 
that those guys were actually pretty good at what they did. And even with a $10,000 budget, they created a film that looked pretty damn good, if I should say so myself. Maybe the editing could have been a little bit better, but the film looked good. And now all of a sudden I had a reel, uh, which is a, a piece of footage that showed me as a professional actor in a lead role. So once I had that, I already built up my resume a little bit more. And, and, then, uh, and, and then I had something to show to people that showed them that I was a serious actor. I'll get into more a little bit later about how I actually scored my next gig in the, in the next section that we'll talk about. But something that important that you said is what your acting teacher said to you, which is, why did you pick that scene? You should have picked something that you're good at. And that takes us to our next point. After you sort of reset your brain and became, become aware, a lot of people get stuck again um, because they know they want to do something, but they don't know what they should do. They don't know what skill they should capitalize on. Um, and there's some, there's definitely ways that you can go start going about evaluating your own strengths. You know, again, going back to the example of how we are when we're growing up. When you go to school, everybody takes general studies. Uh, you go to high school, you have to be good at history, art, math, science, you name it. And if you're not good at any one of those things, you're ridiculed by your peers, your parents, and really the education system ends up punishing you because you're just not good at certain things. Um, unfortunately for certain people, that means they're going to get bad grades and they're considered not as smart. But that is just the problem with the education system. In reality, everybody has very different strengths. But what happens since we're conditioned at a certain age to be good at everything, when we grow up and we get real jobs, we start comparing ourselves to people that are generally good, let's say, at a lot of different things, and, and you develop a feeling of inadequacy. And this can be completely debilitating because of all, all of a sudden you think, oh, you know what, I'm not very good at a lot of things, and so why would I pursue even anything of interest when there's so many people that are more talented than me. This is, of course, a detrimental uh, way of looking at things. The truth is, each of us has very, very specific strengths, unless we're Elon Musk, for example, and then we're just incredibly genius at everything. But most of us are really only good, or I should say great, at a handful of things, or one or two things. And while, of course, it's important to try to improve on your weaknesses, your time is better spent focusing on your strengths and applying your strengths. So how do you identify um, whether or not you're strong at something? Well, I'll give you an example um, of, of, of my own little story. Um, Sergey and I grew up in a family of teachers. And we always knew that we wanted to teach. I mean, at work, I'd constantly be caught up, uh, brought up to uh, explain complicated concepts to people about certain things, like whether it was Excel or if I was working at a tech startup, I'd be brought into client meetings like at, let's say, BBC America, where eventually, instead of the CTO, uh, the video software company where I was working would bring me into a meeting to pitch, you know, uh, seven different executives on our technology for 45 minutes straight, right? So how did I become good at that? Or I should say, how did that lead me to identifying that I was better a good teacher. I knew that I wanted to teach, um, but teaching at a school or university to me meant that you had to get a higher degree. So I knew it wouldn't be it would, there would be a lot of obstacles and a lot of friction for me to get a job working at a university, for example, even though I liked the feeling of teaching people, uh, as I did in my previous roles at different companies. I mean, you also just had no interest in in the kind of salaries that teaching jobs offered. Unfortunately, it's a crime, but teachers don't get paid nearly enough for everything that they have to do uh, and really for what it takes to be really, really good at the craft of teaching. So I knew I wasn't going to get a job at, a, at an academic institution. So what else could I do? Well, we identified at the time uh, that there were coding schools popping up all over the country that within 12 to, to 16 weeks would teach somebody how to become a software engineer. And so the first thing that we did is we set up meetings with, what was it, like seven or eight coding schools? Mm -hmm. Seven or eight coding schools in the country um, to basically identify where maybe we could fill some gaps. So by that time, we had worked at a bunch of different tech companies with a lot of engineers. And so we knew that we had some skills that we could potentially offer them. And by the way, at this point, we had already given a few talks, free talks at meetups. We reached out to meetup organizers and offered to speak about a specific topic, and we the topics were well received, so we had some 
uh, proof there that people liked when we spoke in public and we were teaching certain concepts. Yep, there was already some positive indicators there, which of course gave us the confidence to move forward with reaching out cold to, to coding schools uh, in the country. But remember, it took the first step of action towards giving a talk in front of a bunch of strangers, even though we've never done it before in that setting. So going back to action and also going back to the fact that um, anything you do can be helpful for you uh, anytime down the line. And so we ended up pitching these coding schools and we found one that specifically wanted uh, us to train their next cohort of software engineers on soft skills. So how do you give a presentation in a meeting once you get a job as a software engineer? How do you talk to salespeople? How do you um, uh, run a meeting? How do you move up in your career? Just to demystify that a little bit, um, it's not that we necessarily found a school that wanted us to do this. We guessed what we thought these schools wanted, and we had a menu of items that fell under the bucket of soft skills. Really, it was just things that we could teach. And we reached out to as many as possible, and some of them it resonated with. And so that's how we identified this first one. And, and we guessed is, is, is what we did initially. Uh, but through those seven or eight meetings with different coding schools, we asked questions and ultimately identified where the pain points would be. And within basically three weeks, I think, of conceiving this idea, uh, we had uh, a company that asked us to send a proposal. Uh, and essentially, we got a deal to do a training for them. Uh, the way that we ended up structuring it was a one day, seven hour interactive training. Uh, so now all of a sudden we got paid up front and we had to come up with seven hours worth of material. We had never done that before. Teach a class for seven hours. So that, uh, we, that was a little bit scary if I, if I recall. It was definitely scary and there was definitely some imposter syndrome there, but we already got paid so we had to do it. Uh, and we were flying out to Colorado from New York City to do this. And so, what we end up doing is we just basically went through all the content we ever created. We sat down and outlined uh, what this lecture would look like. We split it up into two parts, and we ended up coming up with 150 slides uh, worth of content, which included interacting activities and exercises. Uh, and once we had that on paper, we practiced this seven-hour lecture end-to-end -end probably four or five times, end-to-end. -end. Yep. So we spent over 40 hours, if my math is right, uh, just rehearsing this. So when the time came, we delivered the lecture and the reviews we got were awesome. I mean, people told us that, you know, we changed their perspective on things, that they felt a lot more prepared and ready to get into the real world once they graduated from the coding school in three or four weeks. They had a better toolkit for identifying opportunities where they would be a better fit. And all this stuff was amazing. I mean, before this, we didn't really know if we'd be good teachers in, in terms of teaching concepts to somebody uh, or complicated concepts or really anything. And this was yet another proof point uh, to say that we are good at that. And so when ultimately I got an opportunity to teach entrepreneurship at a university class, which later I realized uh, didn't require a PhD, it required practical experience, which I had having started my own business with Sergey. Uh, after the first class, the, one of the instructors that sat in on the class said that it was one of the, one of the best classes she'd seen taught, um, in the semester. And even though this was my first class, she thought that I had been teaching for a very long time. So clearly through this process, I refined my teaching skills, uh, but also realized that a, not only is it something that I enjoy, but B it's something that I'm better at than a bunch of other people. So why not pursue it? And, and think about like, if you rewound uh, a year before that, uh, or maybe even two years before that, if Vadim said to someone that he's going to be teaching a course or delivering a seven hour lecture or now teaching a semester long course, he would probably be laughed at. He'd say, okay, great. Come back in, in five or 10 years when you have your PhD. And he could have listened to that and, you know, put his head down and, and not ever done it. But he identified his strengths by going out there, trying to find speaking gigs, trying to deliver some talks to see what topics could he talk about well, and that gave him the confidence to ultimately go on and level up. And now we have this content; we can sell it. To, we can sell it over and over again, uh, whenever we want to, essentially. So once you've created it, once you've done it, once you already have that as an asset. So once I identified what I was interested in, the next step was what, Sergey? Which is sort of the what rounds this whole thing out, right? The first step is resetting your mind, being open 
to change and being open to growth. The second step is understanding what you're good at and realizing that you don't have to be good at everything, but that you should focus on the things that either you're interested in or be that you think you're good at. And so then what's the third step? What did we do? Well, there's little left to do but act. <laughs> so, And we're not talking about the acting class. Well, not the acting class, but you need to, you need to create the habit of action. Create a bias in your mind for action. When you're starting to feel doubt, when you're st- try- starting to sit down and do research and try to come up with a million reasons why you should or should not do something, put all of that away. Stop researching. Stop doubting yourself and just act toward making it a reality. Now, I'll, this brings me back uh, to my story of acting and how I ended up actually getting on a pilot with a with a major network, with ABC, uh, at the time, uh, just from that one feature film. We talked about identifying your strengths. I had realized that if I'm going to go after every single acting gig out there, I'm going to fail because I'm competing against way more experienced people. So I knew that my strength was that I can speak fluent Russian. And I prominently, да, я могу, да, конечно. Uh, <laughs> and so I put that on my acting resume, and I made sure to feature it every time I applied to something. Um, but you know, just having that differentiator was not enough. It was a strength that I could speak Russian, but it wasn't enough. I had to create that bias toward action. So what I did once I completed that feature film is I I didn't have an agent, and I didn't have a network to get into an agency. And I lived in Boston. There aren't that many agents in Boston, but there are a couple of casting agencies uh, where they reach out when they need to fill roles. So they're not a dedicated agent for you. They just, it's a, it's a casting place. So I submitted my resume and my headshot to every casting agency that I could find in the city. And it took a while, about six months, but six months later, I, I didn't hear anything. And six months later, I had somebody reach out to me about a pilot for ABC where they needed somebody that spoke Russian. And I came in to audition. So I, you know, I said yes. That was the first step. I said, yes, I'm going to come in for this audition. I had to move things around. I might have had to take a few hours out of work to actually go and make this audition. Uh, but I went there and I got the role. I got one role, actually. Then they told me that, you know what, we're cutting this role, but we have another Russian-speaking role. And I just was flexible. I'm like, I'll take whatever you give me. And it was four lines of dialogue where I spoke Russian. But it was one full day of filming, and it actually paid pretty well because uh, SAG after laws, they have to pay you well, even if it's one day of work. Um, if you have some lines, speaking lines in a, in a film or in a show, and since this was a multi-million dollar production uh, made by Shonda Rhimes, a uh, famous producer, uh, then they have to pay you well. So I did it, and, I, and actually by the end of it, the executive, one of the executive producers and main writers of the show came up to me and said, she liked me so much that if the pilot got picked up, she would write me into the show as a character. So you can start to see what happens when you start to act on your impulses, act on your desires, but also say yes to things. I had no idea when I submitted my name to that casting agency that all this stuff would come around and at the end of it, I would have a a famous writer for a show tell me that she loved my work, where just a year earlier, I had an agent who was worth nothing to me at that point, by the time I, I was done with this pilot, tell me that I'm not worth it. To a lot of people, the idea of finally acting towards whatever it is you want to accomplish can be pretty daunting. But once you realize that when you get out there and start doing stuff, you don't know what amazing things could happen, you're more likely to do it. Uh, Another thing that Sergey forgot to mention is when he was uh, working on that pilot, he was actually a better Russian speaker than the Russian translator they hired, right? So weren't you, didn't you get to train a couple of the actors? And these are some famous folks. They hired a, yeah, they had a professional speech coach who actually didn't speak any Russian, but he knew accents very well. Uh, but I, the, the, some of the leads of that show would come to me to ask how to do things, and they would record on their phones their lines in Russian and go practice them in the trailer. So I built a lot of camaraderie with the actors there too, and it was really cool really cool experience. And talk about what Vadim said earlier, which is you never know how the things that you do now, the things that you act on now can benefit you in the future. They most certainly will pay dividends. Don't try to guess how they will, but they will. That acting experience led to me doing uh, several voiceover projects that I got paid for. And ultimately it gave 
us the skills to be able to do this podcast, which I would have never thought years ago when I started doing this. So it all comes full circle and you can never predict how it will. And you can draw the thread even all the way back to when we gave our first talk in New York City that made you comfortable in front of large groups of people or when we were in speech and debate clubs as a couple of nerds in high school debating so in, the, in, in the Congress um, about fake bills. But anything that you do can come full circle and add value at some point in your life. But the first step, or really the third step, if, if you go <laughs> through the, the, the podcast is uh, acting and actually doing something towards it. So hopefully for some of you, if you were feeling stuck, if you had that, it, it's a feeling in, in the pit of your stomach, really. It, and, and a lot of times it doesn't go away. But once you start acting, uh, once you start making moves, we guarantee, I mean, this is the only thing that's really worked for us is once you get to that point where you can act, just the sheer act of acting, <laughs> um, but just the sheer act of progress will make you feel more fulfilled, will remove that sort of painful feeling at the pit of your stomach. So right after you're done listening to this podcast, whatever it is you have on your mind, if you're at that stage where you're ready to move forward, just do it. Just do it. Just do it. And you know what? Email us, vadim at thementors.co.co, Sergey S-E-R-G-E-I, at thementors.co, and tell us, tell us how you did. A couple of uh, books that I want to mention, um, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey, talks about this idea of, of how to learn how to react to things and how to change your mentality and change your habits. Uh, another book that I read recently was by Phil Knight, Shoe Dog. Mm. This is a guy who started a shoe company after uh, doing a school project on importing shoes from Japan and being obsessed with it for decades. And actually for the first, for a very long time, doing it on the side. Read it. I won't spoil it for you. But um, you could do stuff on the side. You can do stuff on the side. You don't have to wait to have a bunch of money in the bank. You have free time in the day. And if you feel like you don't have free time in the day, make free time. All right. Well, thank you all for listening. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Subscribe. Leave a review if you feel so inclined. Just know that we will love you forever. We will marry. I will marry you. I will you. marry. Uh, will we you will marry? do a polygamous <laughs> marriage. <laughs> That's legal. What do we have to move for that? Uh, Utah? I don't know. I'm making that up. We'll figure it out. Thanks all. It's The Mentors signing off. Laters.